And we are live any minute. So welcome everyone. Sorry, I'm jumping Good morning. ahead. Good morning and welcome. We are live on Facebook. We want to give it a couple more minutes to let people in. It looks like it's slowing down. Chi-Chi, it's up to you. I'll leave it. Leave it to you. We can get started in about uh, 30 seconds. Okay. All right, good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, I am so pleased to have you here. Uh, my name is Chinanya and Kemra. I also go by Chi Chi, and I am representing the Assembly for the Arts as a member of our Board of Trustees. Uh, I am currently the founder and director of strategy for my own social advocacy think tank here in the region. Uh, the name of my think tank is Enlightened Solutions. And we publish research around the lived experiences of individuals right here in Northeast Ohio. On behalf of Jeremy Johnson and the Board of Trustees, I am super pleased and thankful that you all are joining us uh, today for this morning's meeting. These assemblies are designed as peer advisory groups that help keep us accountable and help keep you informed. As Jeremy often says, we exist to expand the pie of resources and to increase equity in Greater Cleveland's art and cultural centers. As our name suggests, we can only do this by working together. Your contributions, your input, your feedback, your grit is what moves us collectively forward towards a better and more inclusive Cleveland. I'd like to start us off this morning, however, with a brief land acknowledgement. We hold this discussion on the sacred land of native peoples who came before us. The land all around us remains connected to the native tribes and, and the ancestors who once inhabited it. We hold space to acknowledge their spirits. Lastly, we encourage all people of all abilities to participate in these sessions. Live transcripts are available for today's discussion and instructions on how to enable that captioning option can be found directly in the chat box. I just dropped it in there right now. So before we get started, I'd like to give some brief and very quick introductions. Um, I'm not quite certain if any assembly board members are on the line right now, but we uh, genuinely welcome you all this morning and we're really proud and happy to have you with us. Uh, we'd like to also uh, introduce the assembly team that's joining us today. That's Valerie Schumacher, Meg Matko, Leandra Richardson, Kristen Pooch, as well as Abby and Jeremy who couldn't be on the call today. We work closely with Cuyahoga Arts and Culture and thank our teammates here at and from CAC. Uh, I think Jake Sinatra, uh, is he on the line? If he is, um, if you'd like to offer a few words on Jill's behalf. You can just come off mute Great. if you're, if you're here. Me? Yes, yeah. I can. Great. Great, yeah, I'll just offer a couple quick updates in regards to CAC's grant making to nonprofits on behalf of Jill Paulson and the CAC team. So just two focus areas I just wanna mention quickly this morning. We received more than 215 applications to our 2023 cultural heritage and project support grant programs, which are two of our core grant programs. So just wanted to shout out to the groups, the nonprofits on the call today who 
work to get those into us earlier this month. We're now turning those out to our panel of experts across the nation. Uh, we'll uh, have those um, turn, you know, have have those adjudicated in our panel in September and, and off to our board for approval in November for funding in 2023. And then in regards to relief funding for nonprofits as well, we received earlier this week 150 applications from non nonprofits who are uh, applying for the 1.63 million CAC share of the county relief funds made possible by ARPA. So those grants will range from two to seventy five thousand dollars and. We'll be going before our board and approval mid-September with plans to release those funds in the in the weeks thereafter. So um, thanks to just the applicants, the nonprofits who are on the call this morning who are doing double duty in what we know is a busy application season. And um, shout out to Assembly. Um, we, we're working closely together, you know, to stay in touch with county and city leadership regarding other relief funds. And I'm sure we'll work together to keep you updated as any new info becomes available. So thanks again, Chi Chi, Valerie, Assembly team for hosting this space this morning. It's great to be here. Wonderful. Those are phenomenal updates. Awesome updates. Now I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to hand it to the team um, at the assembly. Valerie is going to share some updates about our work. Hi, everyone. Um, am I unmuted? Am I good? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I, you may have seen, recognize this um, I, on behalf of Jeremy, as, as we said, um, I'll be providing some brief updates. Um, and while I quickly walk through it, um, I wanted to have you all think about a question for the chat. So a few of us on the team um, have been to a few conferences on equity lately, and um, especially given our guest host today, um, we've both been, you know, been to workshops on people uh, to make things more accessible for people with disabilities to access arts and culture and also racial equity in the business and in the workplace. So knowing that equity has been consistently a concern of the field overall, we've heard it from all different corners. Um, and we have a sense of what that means and what that means for you. Um, the question, and this was posed at one of the uh, conferences, is why is equity important to you? Why do you invest your time in this important work? And as an individual or as a business or as an organization, what are the reasons behind, um, behind that? So we can all um, kind of be aware. Um, there's no wrong answers. If you don't want to put it in the public chat, um, you can send it directly to the hosts and only Megan and I will see it. Megan, Leandra and I will see it. Um, and obviously please, just be respectful and mindful. And the idea is to have a better understanding of what is driving the field as our service organization, as we serve you, um, and as we work towards this collective goal of equity and really just getting a basic understanding. So that's just food for thought if you get bored with my voice and you wanna have a conversation in the chat. Um, so moving on to some updates here, I'm gonna start with, and my, screen will move forward when I tell it to. Okay. Um, the uh, So networking and promotion. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, announce, if you haven't seen it already, that we've launched a membership program. The idea is very simple. Um, in order to be a unified voice, we need to be a collective. So individual membership in order to remain equitable is it's pay what you can. If you can't, you can essentially get become a member for free if that's what you feel comfortable sharing, um, or you can donate to the cause. It's it's really up to you. Um, we want every single person who wants to be a part of this movement to join this movement and add their name to the list. Um, we're also uh, secondly um, regarding the promotional piece. We're working and talking regularly with Destination Cleveland. Um, so we recently ran a Summer of the Arts and Culture campaign with Destination Cleveland on Places.Travel. So that was a paid campaign, and you can see a, a screenshot of that here. So if you go to Places.Travel, you'll be able to see that in the, the Cleveland um, section of that website. Um, and we're also talking um, with closely with Cuyahoga Arts and Culture and discussing more ways to work together on the event marketing tool, clevelandartsevents.com. So we're talking about merging some of the Creative Compass listings that our prior organization, um, one of our founding organizations was involved in creating and listings. 
And if you're familiar with any of the resources, guides, and content, a lot of that has already been migrated over to the assembly website. So there's a really good wealth of information there already. Um, and obviously we're continuing to promote events that you all put in, but it's not only, um, and one of the things that assembly is really excited about is um, getting involved in and promoting work that's happening by the nonprofits as well as the individual artists and the businesses. So it's a really collective and cohesive event calendar. And that's already true. Anybody can already su uh, submit an event if they'd like. Um, for advocacy, um, we have a public officials breakfast coming up at Worthington Yards. Um, members attend for free, so we already got that little bit of info. Um, at the, uh, the, uh, Oh, and remember to invite your legislators. We'll be sending out invitations to all these folks too, but it's always helpful if your legislator hears from, or if a legislator hears from their own constituents. So um, please welcome them and invite them. Um, and then at the state and local levels, we're continuing to work always in support and of continuing and expanded funding for Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. So much of this is about relationship building and understanding priorities of legislators um, so all of that work is always ongoing. Um, we're also continuing to advocate for specific relief funds due to the unique impact of the pandemic. So you can see some data available in the annual report section of our website. I think it's on our homepage, you say Assembly's first year. There's some data in there about how the field has been affected. Um, for the city of Cleveland, um, and we'll hear a little bit more about what's happening more broadly at the city um, from Chi Chi in a moment. Um, we have, uh, so you were all a part of the Artists for ARPA campaign. Um, I'm looking at my notes, give me one second. Sorry, I just need to take a pause for one second. I'm human, I'm sorry. Okay, so at the city level, both the city administration and city council have indicated their support for funding creative industries. If we're successful, it's likely going to look much different than the county program that you'll hear about in a moment. So they're heavily focused on infrastructure and investing in under-resourced parts of the city. And we wanna make sure that arts and culture is a partner in that work. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, we're still also advocating, Jeremy has been in meetings with Bradford Davey, um, the mayor's staff, uh, I'm not sure what his title is, but uh, we're still advocating for a position dedicated to arts and cultural fields. Um, and we've shared the recommendations that you all and the rest of the community helped us develop. Excuse me, they're available on the website as well. And we're pushing just for strong cultural leadership staffing at the city and just ongoing, ongoing efforts. And I really can't wait to hear uh, what Chi Chi has to say about about that. But I'm 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 gonna. It's not coming yet. I just got a minute. I, but you're I'm excited. Totally fine. You're totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Field support. Um, supporting the field through workbenches and core workshops. Community. Um, I'm sorry. Creatives offer resources for everyone. Is the core workbenches. Um, those have been successful. We have some uh, recordings available on our website. If you'd like to go to that, if you go to programs and then scroll down to workbench, you can link to the recordings also on Facebook. And then we're working to bring wage, um, which I can't remember the, what that stands for, but it's about paying artists equitably and yeah. working artists in the greater economy. Thank you, Meg. Uh, so we're working on bringing them to the community um, to really talk through both from an artist perspective, but also from the people who pay artists and really understanding that relationship. Um, we are the leadership residency, arts leadership residency. We've selected a group. We're not announcing that yet. It will be announced soon. We're very excited about that. That'll be a six month uh, training session and, and sort of really mentorship opportunity for those participants to really dig deep into their business practices um, as arts creative businesses um, and that work. Uh, the ARPA, we'll talk about in a little 
bit, um, but the application at, for businesses and artists are live as of yesterday. And we'll be starting a broader push next week. And lastly, I wanna bring up the fiscal sponsorship program specifically, because I think that's a really under um, promoted piece of the work that we do, but I, it's, it's really impactful. And it's one of our ways to open up capital to people who may not always have access to it. Um, so the, uh, the, at the close of the fiscal year, we had eight, actively, eight projects who were actively fundraising um, and they raised over $159,000 collectively. Um, and that doesn't include the carryover from years prior or any of the projects that have already been completed. So I think that's a really impactful program. And if you know anyone who is working on a project, who's not a nonprofit, who's interested in either becoming a nonprofit or interested in doing a one-off project that is really supportive of the community, they have relationships with foundations, we really wanna serve in that capacity for folks. Um, so since July 1, we've sponsored about three more community projects. They're just starting to fundraise. Um, and you are welcome to donate to any of these projects. We have, these are just a few, 10 Cave Movement, Cleveland Drafts Shooting Without Bullets, Great Culture, Maker Town, uh, Art as a Bridge, uh, the Music in the Garden Festival, Sign Stealing, and Third Culture Ensemble are our main ones. There's a few more um, that you can find on the website there. And then racial equity, I wanna dive a little bit deeper here. Um, this, uh, some of the needs we wanted to meet more immediately, uh, right, as, right as we launched Assembly for the Arts. Um, right now we have our website available in Spanish. I recently learned of a, um, of a tool that you can just plug in to a WordPress website and it's free for up to a certain number of, for one language and up to a certain number of words. So uh, so if you click on the bottom of our website, there's a little button. If you want to read it in Spanish, it's there. So uh, the um, arts leadership residency, we won, uh, when, and you'll see this soon, but a majority of those participants are uh, Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Um, and it's designed to really open up silos. So it, it also includes people who are white and people who are not identifying as um, a particular gender of the uh, non-binary people. So it's really the idea of that was to open up and break some of the silos that are in the arts and cultural sector as we think through some of the business uh, aspects of the work. Um, we'll also be participating in the Front Symposium on Racial Equity on September 16th and 17th. That's primarily going to be focused on museums. And, excuse me, there'll be a number of uh, facilitated groups in that symposium. Uh, at the same time, the Great Lakes African American Writers Conference is happening, and we will be a sponsor of that group. So we encourage you to visit there, particularly for writers, people interested in writing at all levels. Um, they have some great speakers coming up. So I encourage you to go and visit that. Um, and we're partnering with a small project called No More Starving Artists. Artist Jordan Wong is offering. He's also partnering with a number of groups and the Museum of Creative Human Art has offered to recommend a number of young artists and assembly is going to help subsidize those young artists to participate in the workshop that Jordan is providing. Um, so while all this is happening, all this sort of really important short-term immediate work, um, we're doing the important deep work internally. So staff comes together once a week. Um, and I, I don't know if we've shared this before, but we come together at least once a week to discuss the equity in all its forms and to stay current and present with things that are happening. We watch a video, we have a conversation, we read something. Um, and then Jeremy, uh, I really wanna just commend him for the amount of time he spent, not only with the arts and cultural sector overall, but in particular with the creative black and brown communities in Cleveland. Um, they're doing outstanding work. He's been sharing that with us. He's been sharing it with the world. Um, and he's just been spending a lot of time really getting to know the community now that he's back in Cleveland. So I just really want to commend him. Um, 
he wouldn't say that about himself, but I would. <laughs> so, so he's been he's been really busy getting out there and, and understanding the work that we're doing. Um, so he and the board were also challenging business model through both in the way that membership was modeled. Again, we wanted to keep it very inclusive and anyone can become a member if they want. Um, how we price the public officials breakfast is just one price if any member at any level can come for free. Um, and then uh, designing the residency rather than creating it as you know a way for us to earn revenue and charge people to get information that we have we really wanted to make sure that we're shifting how those funds where those funds are going so um we're shifting the direction of funds so it's it's developed as a residency so that we're paying people to spend the time to invest in themselves and invest in that care um and so all this to say is that we are going to continue our long range deep rooted work to build equitable outcomes in Cleveland's arts and cultural fields, Cleveland and greater Cleveland. Um, and one last thing that I heard while I was on the, uh, on the, at the conference um, that I just loved and she had this great, beautiful thought, but she summed it all up by saying, it's hard, it's heavy, but it's hopeful. So I really thought that was just a beautiful quote and I, um, from uh, Monica Jackson at Eaton and she talked about her, her work um, with that company. I mean, it's a huge corporation, global. Um, so I encourage you to look her up if you don't know her. Um, so with that, I'm gonna lead right in. First of all, before I, before I hand it over, does anybody have any questions about the work that we're doing that's not related to our book, because <laughs> we'll get there later. And I don't see chat, so jump, Meg, if you see anything that I should be. Yeah. I'll continue the chat. Okay. Uh, I will put. I will look up the Spanish translation. We can put that in the final. Yes. Um, we'll put that in the in the follow up. So. I would like to give uh, Chi Chi as much time as possible to talk about the amazing work uh, and the, the work that her group and all these other beautiful women and men are doing. And I just saw Archie in the corner there. Archie Green is there too. Um, the Black Women and Girls Commission of the City of Cleveland. Um, so Chi Chi, thank you so much for offering to share a little bit of information, a quick update on what's going on. Um, at the city. Well, thank you um, for that very uh, awesome transition. I really appreciate it. Now I'm nervous. So oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, so like I stated before, um, I co-own a think tank here in the region and our think tank, Enlightened Solutions, is really focused on systems change. Now, I wanna make the connection to what Valerie had grounded our conversation in, and it's in the lens and through the lens of equity, racial equity, accessibility, socioeconomic justice, anti-poverty work, all of those things have direct and clear through lines uh, to the arts and culture community, complete and total correlation. Equity and accessibility conversations, however, should not just stay in those conferences, should not just stay in those forums, in your book clubs, or small side conversations with friends. It's a living and breathing systems change issue, and it is something that the arts and culture business community can take a true and valuable lead on. So again, uh, a little bit about the Black Women and Girls Commission. Before we jump into that, we've got to get the context first. So um, some individuals on this call have heard me give this spiel before, but it's something that I'm extremely passionate about because it has relations uh, to the economic viability of our region. So in 2020, Cleveland was ranked uh, the worst city in America for Black women. How many of you all knew that? Like you can just drop it in the chat. You knew that Cleveland was the worst city in America for black women. How many of you all knew that Cleveland was also ranked the poorest big city in America? So in 2020 and 2021, Cleveland received the dual distinction of not only being the worst city in America for black women, but also being the poorest big city in America. That is a direct um, intersection between both race gender and economics. Cleveland is just under 30% black women. 
This, this distinction that we gained in 2020 uh, became even more apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic. This has, again, serious um, issues when you're talking about the economic viability of our region. And again, um, moving on to the arts and culture community, this is something that everyone on this call can definitely take a lead in. So since Enlightened Solutions believes that Cleveland is the epicenter of inequality in America, this is absolutely the best place to create solutions. By centering Black women, we are focusing on the most marginalized individuals within our region. So when we saw this article in Bloomberg that stated that we were the worst city in America for Black women, the first thing that I thought was, Duh, it really is. Um, but the second thing that I noticed was that in the article and in the uh, research, the accompanying research around it, which utilized publicly sourced data, Department of Labor statistics, matriculation through high school attainment, those kinds of open source data um, uh, statistics. Uh, the first thing that I noticed from the articles and those statistics is that nobody actually spoke to any Black women in the region at all. Nobody interviewed them. Nobody spoke to Black women in the worst performing regions. And nobody spoke to Black women in the highest performing regions. So immediately I looked at my partner and I said, I guess we're going to have to interview Black women in this region. I want to know what Black women are thinking and what the textures are around that kind of marginalization. So I'm going to drop it in the chat. This was our phenomenological research project. It is called Project Noir. I thought that we would receive maybe 50 responses from Black women here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, within a six week period, we received over 450 responses. And in fact, we had to shut the survey down um, early because we started getting responses as far away as Baltimore, Hawaii, Denver, Houston, Texas. And although I really like that data and I really wanted to know more, I wanted to seriously focus on what is happening here in Cleveland. Now, I'm gonna pause for a second because I know that I gave a lot of information here and I wanna look inside the chat to see if I can um, answer any questions, or if I should just move forward. So give me a second to mute myself and I'm gonna go through the chat. Yeah, so uh, around the comment about we're not necessarily a poor city, I actually agree. I actually agree. I think that we have a city that has an exceptional amount of generational wealth, but a lot of those resources are siloed into particular areas, particular regions, particular foundations. And those resources, whether they are financial resources, whether educational resources, they're not necessarily democratized. And I say this as a person that comes from an immense amount of privilege. And this is something that I know factually. I'm from Pepper Pike. Both of my parents are overly educated. I'm overly educated. I, I am an individual that understands that lens, mainly because I've seen it and I've lived it. Cleveland isn't necessarily a poor city, but Cleveland has been made poor because of those hoarding of resources. So jumping back into Project Noir, uh, we researched three specific areas, workplaces, healthcare, and education. And we talked to Black women about their lived experiences. We talked to Black women about, you know, historically, what did it look like in your educational path? We went through with a 25 question survey. And then we also followed up with one and a half to two and a half hour one-on-one um, -on -one interviews. So it was a very, very long process, but I learned a ton. And some of the themes that I learned um, include uh, workplace themes, education themes, and healthcare themes. For the purposes of this conversation, I'm only going to stick on workplaces and then lightly touch on education. So workplace themes include discrepancies in pay, benefits, professional isolation, lack of mentorship. You all are hearing these workplace themes. And again, these are business decisions that individuals are having that have life ramifications for the Black women in our region. And if you zoom out 
into the arts and culture sphere, you can see discrepancies in pay and benefits. All artists understand that. But then you are compounding that marginalization because of gender and race. From our statistics in Project Noir, the participants, those 450 Black women, 74% of respondents felt that they had been passed over for job opportunities or promotions that they were qualified for. 76% of Black women have been paid less than coworkers in a similar position. Many of them found out uh, during either professional developments or forums or just through, again, open source data. 65% of Black women uh, that took Project Noir, these respondents have been excluded from important meetings relevant to their jobs. 54% of Project Noir participants have been retaliated against when they objected to inappropriate comments about their hair, their face, their clothing. So all of these different statistics, right, are things that Black women not only are experiencing, but are compounding that marginalization in our region. Moving forward to education, 56 were steered into lower paying professions and 73% felt excluded from opportunities. Now, again, this is very, very heavy work. <laughs> this is very, very heavy information that you all are digesting early this morning. I wanna take a pause uh, again to look at the chat and then move forward to the brightness of the Black Women and Girls Commission here in Cleveland. All right, so jumping forward, the city of Cleveland and Cleveland City Council believe that Project Noir research work was valuable and could be scaffolded through the city. I wanna thank Mayor Bibb and his administration for taking the time to not only read this research, but to also digest and create solutions from it. And I also wanna thank Cleveland City Council for codifying this into law. So the Cleveland Commission on Black Women and Girls, the mission is to improve the quality of life for women and girls by advocating, initiating, championing programs and legislation that strengthen families and communities. The vision is simple. Women and girls within the city of Cleveland deserve access to unlimited opportunities to achieve social, health, and economic equality. Now, applications are currently open. They're open until August 31st um, at midnight. I'm going to drop it in the chat. And the qualifications are really simple. Are you a Black woman that lives in Cleveland? Apply. Do you know any Black women that live in Cleveland? Apply. There are spaces for high school students as well and college students so that we are getting Gen Z, we are getting uh, really young individuals invested and involved within our region. So again, if you have any questions, the majority of the details are on the City of Cleveland website and there will be um, specific details around that. So again, thank you so much, so, so, so much for listening um, and being leaders in equity within the arts and culture space. And I want to pause for any questions or reactions that you all may have before I hand it over to Meg. And I think we people can go ahead and unmute themselves just directly if you're more comfortable just jumping in. Hi, how you doing? Hi, Ephraim. Hi, this is Ephraim Abdullah. I think what you're doing is a beautiful work. Oh, I thoroughly appreciate that. Sometimes in systems change, you feel like you're not doing anything. So <laughs> I spend most of my time looking at Excel sheets. So thank you. I can understand what you're, what you're experiencing. Um, I was raised um, in my culture to understand how to um, love and protect the Black woman. I was raised by my father, and that was the core of my raising is how to uh, love and protect the black woman as well as all women, you know? And I appreciate what you're doing because this is an area that has not been addressed and it, it goes right in the line of equity. So I appreciate the conversation and the realization of the height of how this awareness 
is to be exposed. Now, I'm going to say something, and it's artistic because I'm an artist, um, but I would want it to be considered, you know, uh, as far as the acknowledgement of the equity and the racial um, um, equity and the inclusion and diversity. Diversity. Um, the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is a mark that the world knows as, a, a, and I'm not saying we got to do anything. I'm just speaking. It's an a, a image given to America, but it's a fraudulent image because the original of the Statue of Liberty was an image of an Asiatic black woman and its purpose was for um, black America liberating out of slavery through the end of the Civil War. And, you know, I know that there was a, a House bill that was passed last year in August to remove all of Confederate um, based statues. And I'm just speaking because it's a conversation that I hear that needs to be addressed, but I don't know exactly which artist is going to really ch champion taking on this task. So when the original statue was sent, it was the image of a black woman and its purpose was the liberation out of slavery through the Civil War. Um, so what has happened was the Confederate Party, at the time the Democrats, ran uh, fundraisers to raise money to send that statue back and have it re-image to looking like a guardian, like a Cleveland guardian. That's <laughs> A female Cleveland Guardian is what it looks like. But however, I think it should be restored to its proper image in which the gift was given. Because that's like fraud, you know. And this is a, a part of the work that needs to happen to set things right and put things where they're supposed to be at in our history and in this country. It's a beautiful thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing to tell the truth and put the truth where it belongs. And with that, I'm going to digress. I appreciate you for listening. I think the work you're doing is amazing and beautiful. Thank you so much for that history lesson. Um, I'm a former history teacher, so I appreciate that more than you know. I really do. Anyone else want to jump off of mute or drop something in the chat before we move forward? I'm going to put my contact information inside the chat currently and just wait for y'all. Looks like there's a comment from a couple of comments. Um, one from Grafton Nunes. The organization Newbridge educates Black women and men for work in the healthcare industry. It's an interesting site working to accomplish the goals that you articulate. So I'm wondering if you're, um, have you worked with them, Chi Chi, or you're familiar with that, with Newbridge? So we haven't. Um, it, it, I'm familiar with Newbridge, but we haven't worked with them. Um, our current goals are obviously very lofty. Um, we have uh, attempted to work with our three anchor um, institutions, our three healthcare anchor institutions, um, and attempted to partner with them. Many of them have seen, um, you know, a lot of their staffing, um, you know, leave uh, due to COVID, due to um, a lot of the structural issues that deal with, you know, hospital administration. Um, and I will just say that the response has been very in anemic. And I will leave it at that. The responses from our healthcare institutions around the healthcare issues here in Cleveland, especially because we have uh, one of the highest infant mortality rates um, in the nation. We have a maternal health crisis here in Cleveland. Um, you would think that the response would be a little bit more robust, but 
you can find a lot of those healthcare stories um, and vignettes uh, within Project Noir. Um, there's also a podcast element if you wanted to listen to clips of the interviews. Um, we re-recorded them uh, utilizing voice actors, um, Black women voice actors here in the region to protect their anonymity. So um, if you're interested in uh, listening to it, if you're not a huge reader, there's that option as well, that accessibility option. Again, thank you all so much for allowing me to speak today. I'm thrilled to be able to address you. And more than that, feel free to uh, keep the doors of communication open and drop me an email, however you feel. Thank you, and I'll pass it over to Meg. Thank you, thank you so much. That was a very powerful presentation. We appreciate you. Um, it's gonna be hard to follow that with information about uh, money. <laughs> But I'm going to do my best. So we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the um, Cuyahoga ARPA for Arts program um, for a bit. I want to leave a little bit of time so we can get to the Arts and Economic Prosperity Six surveying effort that we're going to that we're engaged in as well. So this is not going to be an in-depth uh, tutorial of the application or the program, but just some key takeaways. We will have workshops, informational workshops. Um, throughout the application period. So you can learn more information there. Um, but in terms of a few key updates for this program, this program is for artists, individual artists and creative businesses. So if you're unsure about which program to apply to, you can only apply to one of the programs. Um, the definitions for both of those are in the guidelines. One of the key distinctions between an individual artist and a creative business in this case would be that as a business, in order to apply as a business, you would have to employ um, full-time employees, FTEs. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. Um, I just wanna emphasize the guidelines for the program, which are up on the website. We're gonna take a look at that in a second. I really encourage everyone to closely look through those. Um, they have all the information. We will have a set of FAQs up there. So please refer to that for your most comprehensive set of information. Of course, the assembly staff is always here to help and, and answer questions, um, but that is a good starting point. The online applications are live, as Valerie said. So they are available at the site that is, or that address that's listed there, backslash ARPA. The deadline is September 30th. Paper applications will be available soon. Um, those will be available as a download on the assembly site. And we will also have copies of applications at various workshops um, and a couple of key locations. So there's a few more updates coming to that ARPA page soon. So keep an eye out. Um, one major thing I wanna mention about this program, it, it, this is not a merit-based grant. This is not an artistic merit-based or creative excellence grant program. It, these are federal relief funds for, to assist with economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and they are based on need. So I think that's just one thing to really keep in mind um, as you're thinking about applying uh, for this program. Um, the eligibility questions in the application. So at the beginning of both applications, there are a set of eligibility screening applications. So please be very careful about how you answer those. Um, if you are to answer one that would deem you ineligible, it will bump you out of the application and you won't be able to get back in. So if you answer one you know, incorrectly by mistake, that's, that's, an op that's a possibility. Um, but please be mindful of those questions because they will, they will kick you out. Um, how much money? So we have for the artist program, it will be a, a flat amount of $2,500 for all eligible artists that receive the funding and all eligible businesses will receive up to the maximum funding amount for their budget size. So it's a tiered system um, based on budget with the, the smallest amount being 5,000 and the highest amount being 45,000 for businesses. So again, that is based on budget size um, for businesses. In the application itself, um, there are no requirements for uploads of tax documents or financial records. We are not 
requesting that information to increase ease of access to this program. That can be um, a lot and you know hard to keep all of those records in place for something like this. We will ask for a W-9 uh, if you are funded through the program. So some of the things that you would have want to have prepared in order to apply are your as an artist and a business income or revenue from the years uh, 2019 through 2021, um, work samples as a creative person and evidence of your creative business. Um, yes, thank you, Val, for pulling up this site so we can take a look at it um, online. And then artists, we're asking for household income and your household size. Businesses, we're looking for 2021 20, expenses. Again, this information is all in the guidelines um, and on the, on the site. So that is there. And the last thing I want to cover, because I have a feeling there's probably going to be a few questions, um, is the equity and accessibility uh, that we, the measures that we're employing for this program, because that is a massive component of this program. So in terms of information, we're offering, like I said, workshops. We'll have three in-person workshops and one virtual workshop. Um, plus a set of virtual office hours. Um, so that is gonna be sort of open times when folks can come in and ask questions about the application or if they need help. Um, the first workshop is August 24th at 6 p.m. Um, Val, can you navigate to where, oh, you've got the button up there. So there's a button for workshops and then you can register for those. Um, as well. We will have the other, the virtual one and the office hours up there shortly. So um, <clears throat> continuing with the equity and accessibility, we are extending the deadline. This is a pretty long application period. So starting yesterday through September 30th is a pretty, that's about what, six weeks. That's a pretty extended time to be applying so that we can make sure that the most possible people um, in Cuyahoga County are aware of this program and have the opportunity to apply. Um, we're not using a first come first serve model. So this is, you know, applying early does not increase your likelihood of getting funded. We are doing it this way to, again, increase the access to the program for folks that don't know about it right away. Um, so that's important. We have amped up our outreach for this program. And in fact, I wanted to just kind of give a shout out to Veronica Thornton, who is now with us on the assembly team as our community outreach consultant. Veronica, if you are there, would you say hi? I know I saw you. Hey, hi. There you he is. <laughs> <laughs> hi, everyone. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, just reach out if you need any assistance. Um, I'm here to help. AP, so on and so on. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Veronica's amazing. And Veronica mm -hmm. is in all the places all the time. She's she's a wonderful person, knows this program. So please, you know, either of us are here to help you. Um, we also, as Valerie mentioned, we have Spanish translation of the website and we will have a Spanish translation of the application. Uh, we have a dedicated inbox for questions. So that is ARPA, A-R-P-A at assemblycle.org. Any questions you have, send them there. Um, oh, there is the Spanish version of the website. It looks awesome. A um, couple last things to paper applications. I mentioned that we will have one-on-one -on -one staff support also for access needs or for anyone that needs support in completing the application. Um, or has questions, we'll also be offering a large print version of the application um, for low vision and uh, low vision folks. Um, and then a major media push. So this is going out to a lot of places that we haven't touched before um, in terms of publications and neighborhoods. So the information about this program is really gonna get out there on a wide scale, that's the plan. So that's the high level stuff. I'm just trying to keep an eye on time here. Um, but if there are questions, again, like I said, major in-depth stuff is going to get covered in the workshops that Veronica and I will both be handling. And yes, if there's any questions, I know I ran through that like real fast. Can I ask a quick question? 
Absolutely. Um, so I saw in the guidelines that this is for for-profit businesses. So will assembly have anything, will they, will there be any funds through assembly ARPA funds for nonprofits? So the short answer to that is no. So any um, nonprofits will be served through Cuyahoga Arts and Culture through their ARPA funding program. So assembly is by uh, the agreement that we have with Cuyahoga County, assembly um, is responsible for managing the programs for only individual artists and creative for-profit businesses. So yes, and I know Jake is, I think Jake is still here. Um, but he spoke to that just a little bit earlier. So yes, that's a pretty short answer. And then I did see one other, thank you for asking that. Um, creative business be able to apply if it has also applied for ARPA funding through CAC and that is a no. So any, if you are a nonprofit organization, um, you would not necessarily, you would not be also a for-profit business. So for-profit businesses would apply through us, nonprofit organizations would apply through CAC. Um, we are, folks can apply to one of those three programs, um, not to multiple. A um, Couple more, like I said, I wanna leave some time. Uh, the workshops will be recorded for those who cannot attend in person and we will have those available on the ARPA page. And, oh yes, we do not record these assemblies, these assembly meetings, because we want people to be able to speak openly. They're about um, you know, feedback on the work and saying everything that you want to say that's on your mind. Um, so we do not record assemblies, but we will have- I, We actually switched that up. Remember we had some we, back and forth. So it's- we, never, we are recording it? So we're, so we, since we're live, Facebook oh. automatically records it. So we wanted to, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, we had some back and forth about that one. So we, we landed on something and then it switched over. So we are recording, but the recording cannot see the chat. Um, it only sees the video, the slides, and um, any transcript that is through the closed captions. Got it. I stand corrected. Sorry. No, you're good. I'm glad it's recorded. Um, <laughs> like I said, a couple more minutes. Um, Veronica, if you wanted to add anything, please feel free um, to jump in. But like it's no, I think it'd be a good time for Susan to jump in now. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree. So we are going to welcome Susan Shear to speak for a few minutes on the Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 serving, national serving effort that Assembly is involved in. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Susan. Thank you, everyone. Can you see me or hear me? I can hear you. There you are. Okay, got it. Okay, I'm not seeing myself, but that's okay. I want to, uh, first of all, each of you, thank you, Meg. Thank you, Veronica, and thank the entire um, staff and Chi Chi. Uh, pleasure to meet you, Chi Chi. I'm most honored and pleased to to be joining you this morning at the National Arts and Economic Prosperity Study, which is through Americans for the Arts, which is a national arts um, organization and advocacy organization on behalf of the arts. Here, uh, as the reference, uh, rather, instead of saying arts and economic prosperity or national study, because it's a mouthful. So you'll be, always be hearing AEP. So you're, you're thinking, what is AEP6? So I want to share with you that AEP6 is a national study that is conducted every five years and it's conducted um, through Americans for the Arts. And this year, Assembly is leading the initiative for Cuyahoga County, which is most exciting. So with that, uh, what we'll be doing is collecting information 
uh, about um, the national economic impact of the arts and culture industry, the sector, which is so beneficial to uh, reporting to legislators and government officials and arts administrators and media uh, what is going on in the arts sector and also make sure that we're making a case for funding for the arts and cultural sector. And so with that, uh, let me, uh, it's a way in what's going on in the, and let me share a few things for you with you. Uh, first of all, it, it substantiates and illustrates that the arts and culture are an essential driver of economic impact. I'll share uh, numbers in a moment. The prior studies uh, have yielded uh, funding for the arts sector at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, also, uh, what's impressive is that the data from 2017, which is the last time it's conducted since, as I said, it's conducted every five years, shows that, first of all, it generated $166.3 billion in economic activity in arts and culture. So that's through different surveys, through organizational information, and we'll be getting that into that in a moment. And we'll also be doing information sessions. So this is really an overview because it, it gets into a lot of detail. It also supported 4.6 million jobs and generated 27.5 billion in government revenue. So when we think about those numbers, they're just incredible. Most people don't even think about it. Even many people in the arts and cultural sector don't even realize the value that the arts contributes to the sector. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, however. Uh, and with that, what we're going to do is, as you see, it's called for volunteers. We're going to be asking for your help because we need each of your organizations. Uh, and certainly as an artist, you can volunteer, except we're here we're looking at organizations, um, any nonprofits um, that can help get surveys out to your audiences through your different programs uh, and to the, the different communities. So we're not looking at only say, you know, a, a museum or a performing arts venue. These are also through thinking about the zoo or, you know, the botanic gardens or places like that, or through a faith-based organization that, um, you know, provides arts programming or care initiative that has arts programming. So it's, it's, it's not, you know, distinct or uh, exclusive to certain organizations. And what we want to do is make sure that you'll be gathering this data, help assembly gather this data and it'll be through surveys and I won't get into the details now but the surveys are through paper through um, you know um, using tablets and also this year Americans for the Arts has added a QR code and so through QR codes and that's to help facilitate survey gathering and uh, also with that uh, your participation uh, you'll be providing information on your organizations later on in the year actually in January 2023 we'll be providing that uh, survey to you for your organizations so with this collective data it will provide opportunities to you know for audiences to talk about you know what retail establishments they went to while visiting did they go to a, a restaurant uh, did they pay for parking uh, and did they buy gas? Uh, you know, all these different initiatives. And this is really an impact um, and cornerstone of tourism. So when we think about the tourism sector, and certainly, as you know, in uh, Cleveland and in, in Cuyahoga County, the impact of what you receive also from other funding and, you know, your your tax, your, your dollars. So uh, this is really important that we gather this economic data. Um, Assembly is charged with collecting 800 surveys. And this year there's a new initiative um, by Americans for the Arts um, centering uh, economic um, uh, uh, equity and inclusion. So therefore we are also charged, or, you know, assembly is, is focusing on gathering 25% of the applications from both BIPOC, which is black indigenous and people of color and Alana, which is African, Latinx, Asian, Arab, and Native American identifying communities. That means either that we have leaders of color and 50% of their audience of color as a minimum. So again, as uh, 
you know, Valerie shared about all the equity work that Assembly is doing this right in. I also want to point out that AEP6 and is, is really leverages and connects into all the stellar, uh, you know, programs that uh, Assembly is leading. This is not distinct and separate. This connects right in and, uh, you know, with, with everything else. So I think, you know, that's also important. Uh, and I know I don't have much time now. We'll be following through um, as I value your time, and I know it's a minute after 11. We will be following through uh, with a call for and with each of your organizations on asking for your participation, asking for help volunteering, and also with uh, setting up uh, Google sessions, information sessions um, with um, actually their Zoom sessions, but through a Google Docs. So we'll be setting up different sessions as well that will be virtual and that we can address the details. Uh, does anybody have any quick questions? As I, I value your time and I, I, I really don't wanna um, go over. Susan, we have one from uh, Sean Watterson. Okay. Sean, I yeah. see your hand raised. Hi, Susan. Uh, I hi. Own a small independent music venue. I was part of the Save Our Stages campaign and participated on a panel with AFTA uh, at the NEVA conference. I would really love to see these economic studies be inclusive of individual artists and small arts based businesses because uh, I think this is an artificial distinction. And it, it, uh, I, I understand the history behind it, but uh, it can be a little misleading if, if it's called arts and economic prosperity, but it only covers nonprofit institutions. So uh, that's me just uh, advocating that when AEP7 comes along, that it include individual artists. And, 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 and thank you, Sean. I, I have to say that I absolutely agree. Um, and I also have to share that I worked and led the AEP AEP five study, so I you know I'm very aware of what what is, and certainly I will make sure that you know um, assembly and the feedback gets back to Americans for the Arts on making changes. And thank you for your your feedback. I really value it and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And I can see, Sean, there's a lot of feedback and support in your in your your mention, and I agree with you. And uh, again, you you are familiar with Americans for the Arts and involved with them, so you know the past history. And sometimes, you know, it takes as we know, it takes time to make change and implement change, particularly with a large organization. Thank you. Looks like we have one more question. I know sure. we're. A little over time, so yes. if you could jump off, please, please feel free. But um, see December. Is your name? Hi, hi. hi good morning, you? everybody. Pleasure, I'm good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I actually don't have a question. I just wanted to say um, thank you to everyone, including um, those attending. And that I am so glad uh, that I jumped in here today. This is actually my, my very first time um, being in assembly or um, anything connected thereof. And I'm glad I stopped and took the time to jump in and find out about the various things that are happening and have been happening here. And I, it's been very enlightening for sure, for sure. So thank you. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you being here. Any other AEP6? And I just wanna to share too that letters will be going out to everybody. So you'll be receiving a lot of information. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we're, we're a little bit over time, but I want to just hand it right back over to Chi Chi to send us out. Thank you all so much for staying on the line. Um, I just want to close out by saying um, we all here at Assembly really and truly appreciate your time and your insights today. Your feedback is critical to achieving the goals that we have and that we are trying to reach. 
feel free to send any additional thoughts that pop up throughout today or, or the weekend to info at assemblyclee.org. I'm gonna drop it in the chat right now. And the assembly team will get back to you quickly. Thank you all so much again and have a beautiful rest of your day and weekend. Bye.